Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signaling. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about calcium waves, which is a form of calcium signaling that you will see uh, a lot of the time when you are looking at IP3 signaling, basically. Okay, so basically, the first thing I want to do is distinguish between a calcium oscillation and a calcium wave, because they are a similar concept, but they are slightly different. Calcium oscillation and calcium and waves, basically. I want to distinguish between them. Okay, so basically, uh, a calcium oscillation, uh, well, actually, let's start with a calcium wave, what a calcium wave is. So basically, if you have a cell here, then a calcium wave basically means that um, you're starting at one end of this cell, calcium is going to go up, and it, that, let's divide the cell up into pieces, and we'll talk about them one by one. So let's say this is region one, this is region two, and this is just a cartoon, I'm just doing this arbitrarily just to get the uh, concept across. Let's say this is region three, this is region four here, and then finally region five over here. Right. Okay, so a calcium wave means that initially calcium is going to go up in region 1, okay? So if we uh, plot the, uh, the calcium concentration in the cytoplasm versus time, this is what we're going to see. So basically in region 1 what's going to happen is that calcium is going to go up and then it's going to come back down again, okay? And basically what's going to happen is that calcium coming up it going up transiently in region 1 is then going to trigger calcium to go up in uh, region 2. So you'll get something that if I, if I now plot the calcium concentration for region 2, you might get something that looks like this. Okay, so region 1 is that first one, region 2 is this second graph, and then the calcium going up in region 2 is then going to cause um, the calcium to go up in region 3, so you might get something that looks like this for if I plot the calcium concentration in region 3 versus time. Then the calcium spike in region 3 is going to cause another calcium rise in region 4, and Finally, uh, the calcium rising in region 4 is then going to cause the calcium to rise in region 5. So basically, you get this boom, 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 boom effect. Uh, the calcium spike here causes a calcium spike in there, and, it, and the spikes basically propagate through the cell. Okay, so it's kind of analogous, analogous to action potentials propagating along a membrane. An action potential at a certain portion of the membrane causes an action potential in the neighbouring portion, which then causes an action potential in its neighbouring portion, and it propagates along. So that's what a calcium wave is. A calcium oscillation is just something far more general than that. It just refers to if you look at the concentration of calcium in a certain region of cytoplasm, Let's say now we are just looking at, we're putting our electro basic, well, we're putting our measuring device in a single portion of the cytoplasm, basically, and we're measuring calcium concentration there. So let's plot calcium concentration in a single portion of the cell. So let me draw a picture. I am measuring from a specific point in the cell. So you are fixing a point in the cell, and you measure calcium concentration in that point of the cell, and if you get something that looks like this, i.e. oscillations, then that's what is meant by an, uh, a calcium oscillation. That calcium is going up and down and up and down at a specific point. So they're very related ideas, but the uh, distinction between a calcium oscillation and a calcium wave is important. The calcium wave is this propagation in the disturbance in calcium level. And I want to um, emphasize that calcium waves and calcium oscillations can be coupled because what could be happening is that you get a wave of calcium passing this way, and then you get another wave of calcium passing, and another wave, so you can have oscillatory calcium waves, if you like. And then, if you plot, if you look at calcium concentration in a single point of the cell, and you plot its calcium concentration, then you will get something that looks like this, maybe with bigger gaps between the um, adjacent peaks, but you will get an oscillatory calcium level because 
with each wave, calcium will go up. So if you did plot it, uh, its calcium concentration, um, it would oscillate in this way. Okay, so they can be related, but I want to draw that uh, distinction between them because you can have an oscillatory calcium level without triggering a calcium wave. So, um, yes, they are related and they can be, you know, completely related, but um, they aren't the same thing and it's important to understand that. Okay, so now let's have a look at where we see calcium waves. So in the previous video, we saw how you see calcium waves happening in oo sites. Uh, so we looked at the xenopus and the sea urchin oo sites, and we saw how uh, when the sperm touches the oo site, uh, it starts causing these calcium waves to propagate along the uh, cytoplasm of the oo site um, from the place where the sperm touches. Now, is it only oocytes that have calcium waves in? Well, absolutely not. And here's another physiological example where we see um, calcium oscillation uh, waves. Okay, so let's say we've got a hepatocyte here. So in the liver, which is most definitely nothing to do with, well, a very different example from oocytes. So here is a hepatocyte, which just means a liver cell. So here is our hepatocyte. And basically, what we can do is we can trigger calcium waves in this hepatocyte in a similar way to uh, calcium waves that are triggered in urocytes. Uh, we're not going to take a sperm cell and touch the hepatocyte with the sperm cell, but instead what we're going to do is stimulate it with a drug known as phenylephrine. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about phenylephrine before we begin. So phenylephrine. Phenylephrine is very much so related to epinephrine or adrenaline. So let me just go over the structure of phenylephrine. So basically, um, you have a benzene ring here, like so, and off this benzene ring, you have a hydroxyl group up here, and also off this other um, carbon of the benzene ring, you have two carbons like that with a, a hydroxyl group coming off this first carbon here, a hydrogen coming off here, a hydrogen coming off here, a hydrogen coming off here, and then you have a nitrogen with a methyl group up there and a hydrogen up there. And you might be asking, well, why are you showing me this? I don't care. Well, I want to now also draw the structure of epinephrine or adrenaline and show you how similar the structures between uh, these two compounds are. And that will give you a hint of what this drug is going to do. So if I draw epinephrine, it again has this uh, benzene ring. And, or I should just put the other name for epinephrine is adrenaline. Okay, so adrenaline here, yeah, released by the adrenal glands. Okay, um, it's the one that makes you feel, um, uh, it gives you the adrenaline rush, you know, the fear rush, if you like. Um, so here, if you go on a roller coaster, you, that, that feeling is potentially due to adrenaline. Right, okay, so if we draw adrenaline, it has two hydroxyl groups here. It then does have these two carbons coming off here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here, the hydroxyl group up there, hydrogen down there, a nitrogen up here, and methyl group, and a hydrogen. So there's the structure of epinephrine, or adrenaline, and it's based on the, uh, the amino acid tyrosine, and that's where you synthesize it from, uh, not tyramine, tyrosine. Um, and uh, you can see that basically the structure of phenylephrine is almost identical to the structure of epinephrine, or adrenaline. All that you've changed is you've removed this hydroxyl group here to get phenylephrine. And basically, phenylephrine acts as an adrenergic agonist. So it's going to bind and activate the same things that adrenaline uh, slash epinephrine activates. But in fact, it, or it is slightly different. It doesn't have this hydroxyl group. And it's more selective than adrenaline. It binds to one of the adrenergic receptors uh, selectively. It, um, it will bind to the others, but much, much more potent or much more... Uh, with it, it will bind to the um, one of these adrenergic receptors, namely the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. It binds to that with a very, very high affinity. So it's reasonably selective for just binding to this receptor. So if you take this drug, it will bind to your alpha-1 receptors. 
and we're going to use it in our experiment to stimulate these hepatocytes, which do indeed have alpha-1 receptors in their, cyto in their cell membrane. Okay, so we'll uh, continue this discussion in the next video.